and state for his morals. Good evening. <laughs> Amazing what technology can do. I'll start over. On behalf of Fergus Area College Foundation and M State Fergus Falls, I want to welcome each of you here this evening to our 20th annual Big Wood Lecture. It's wonderful to have you here, and we are in store for an enjoyable and light and enlightening evening. And it's it's just so great to see the variety of people who come to be with us tonight. Bigwood Lecture gives us as a foundation the opportunity to honor our donors, and many of our faithful donors are here tonight. And we have several new friends to the foundation that are, are coming for the first time this evening. It's also very appropriate tonight that we thank Ottertail Power Company for its work with Fergus Area College Foundation and the vision that they had to establish Bigwood Lecture 20 years ago when Bob Bigwood, who was then a member, a foundation board member, retired from Ottertail Power Company. This was a way that Ottertail Power Company honored his legacy at Ottertail Power. But Bob was very important to us here College too. He was one of the people who was instrumental in bringing the community college to Fergus Falls, and then a few years after the college was established, making sure that this foundation began to help support the college, and it is still going strong these many years later. We, uh, we enjoy this opportunity to bring to the stage speakers who will engage us enlighten us and, and give us some cause for discussion and what better venue for something like that than our college campus. I'd like to introduce to you tonight the Bigwood family who is here every year. We, we have this annual event and we welcome them as, as our hosts uh, along with the, the foundation. So Bigwoods, will you stand up? Barbie Bigwood is here and her son Rob and his wife Gretchen. Thank you so much. And then I would like to acknowledge our speaker, Richard Pemberton, is here with his wife, Betty Joan, and he is going to have a, a bit more of an introduction in just a bit, but we are so pleased to have him. <laughs> Fergus Area College Foundation is very proud to support the work of the campus of M State, Fergus Falls. Uh, through a very impressive scholarship program, as well as help that we give to different college initiatives, different projects that need to happen in the college year by year. And our, our, our tradition is the night of every Bigwood lecture to hold our annual meeting for the foundation. So our 14 board members met just a few minutes ago and took care of a few pieces of business. I would like at this time all of the foundation board members to stand. Their names are listed on the back of your program. We won't read each one of them, but they can stand so you can see them and we can recognize them. Each of these people is a professional in the community and they come with varied skills and backgrounds that that provide us just an extensive pool of talent that we can put to work to, to do the, the job that the foundation wants to do. And I'm the lucky person who gets to work with them in that. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of them for all the time that they commit to this college. We do have two board members who are going to be leaving us this year, and that's always a, a melancholy time for us. They've given so much, and yet we know it's time for them to move on. And I do want to take a minute to recognize each one of them. Stuart Clufsted, will you stand again? Stuart has served nearly 30 years on this foundation. He was mentored by the best, including W. Earl Williams, Bob Bigwood, and B.K. Sobey. Stuart's faithful service to the board honors the legacy of our founders, and his energy for this place is admirable. We like to say that true blue blood has run through Stuart's veins since he was a student here in the late 70s. He loves this place. 
And we are certain that even though he's not going to be a member of the board anymore, we are going to see him at many a Spartan game and music and theater events. Stuart, thank you so much for your service. Nancy Straub, got you in the back, will you stand up please? Nancy has served the board well in her nine plus years of service on the board. Her ties to the business and economic pulse of this area has proved invaluable for the work that we do. She always has a new idea or an innovative way of looking at things and we really appreciate her enthusiasm and her can-do attitude. She served as the president of the board and she served on several different Committee's always willing to lend a hand, provided excellent leadership, and Nancy, we thank you for all you've done on behalf of the college. <laughs> and we tonight, in addition to, to saying thank you and farewell to a couple of board members, have elected three new people to our board, and I think it's, it's would be appropriate for us to introduce them to you. Brian Boss, before you. Brian is, works in pasta counting at Ottertail Power Company. He's from Underwood, and he's an alum of the college, and we're excited to welcome him to the board. <laughs> Randy Sillerud. Randy is a Vice President for Operations at Lake Region Healthcare. She is also one of our own. She's a graduate of both our practical nursing program and the associate degree nursing program, and at the moment is working on her doctorate in nursing. We're very proud of her, and we're excited again to welcome her to the board. Our third new board member is Greg Wagner, who has returned to his roots in Fergus Falls and is now working with West Central Initiative and he's anxious to get involved with the college as he's come back into the Fergus Falls area. Uh, as we speak, he's in the air flying back from Los Angeles. He's been at a conference and coming into Minneapolis this evening, so he could not be with us. But we welcome him along with Ryan and Randy. Uh, our other item of business tonight was elect our new board officers for next year, and they will be Bob Bigwood, who will continue as our president. Gail Childs will serve as vice president. At Strand will be our treasurer and David Lundin, secretary of the foundation. Now I would like to turn the microphone over and I'll leave it on for Rob Bigwood, our president, who is going to share just a few highlights of the foundation's past year. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we're excited and pleased as a foundation to be able to host this event on an annual basis. And it gives us an opportunity, and, and I think an exciting opportunity, to bring you up to date on the activities of the foundation this past year. Uh, at the end of this fiscal year, uh, we had $3.4 million in assets. Stuart uh, Hofstede tells us that in his first year, he remembers that it was $98,000 in assets. So, under Stewart's fine stewardship, we are now at $3.4 million. We have received a clean audit, which I can announce to you was the best possible audit that an institution can receive. This past year, we received considerable support, the support from the community. We received significant gifts from the Don and Dorothy Malm family to establish a scholarship, and also the John C. Rosengren Estate to support the scholarships for Fergus Falls High School graduates. We're also very grateful for a major endowment of $350,000 this past year from the estate of Henry and Elizabeth Cowles, who asked that the uh, uh, that engineering scholarships be funded with that particular scholarship. And speaking of which, this past year, the foundation has issued over $125,000 in direct student scholarships. Um, we completed another successful campaign with our faculty and staff here who have been wonderful in supporting Foundation each and every year. And this year, nearly $20,000 was contributed by faculty and staff to support the Foundation's mission. Other events this past year, in October, we hosted what we plan to be our first Our Community, Our College event, hosting more than 100 area business people at the college. It was a very fun event. We brought a lot of people 
at our involvement business to the college, to this legacy hall for the first time. And uh, we thought that went very well, and we're intending to continue to hold an annual luncheon. In November, we hosted our over 100 scholarship recipients, their parents, and an opportunity here at our annual scholarship reception. We had an opportunity to meet uh, family and uh, others who uh, could tell them more about the persons that had the foresight to fund the scholarship that uh, they were receiving that year. Also this year, the foundation published uh, a fall and spring edition of Pillar Pride. Uh, and there are copies available in the back if you haven't seen it. Um, you get chills when you read Miller Pride and see all that our Fergus campus of M State is, is up to. Uh, later this, uh, we anticipate in May, we'll be uh, awarding approximately $12,000 in direct grants in support of our faculty to uh, uh, fund uh, innovative uh, teaching ideas that they're bring to their uh, classes, uh, certain equipment that uh, they can use to enhance the learning experience. Uh, our faculty do a great job with limited resources at times, and we're happy to be able to be a source through the foundation for their continued excellence. Uh, just a couple other comments on the foundation. First of all, the college, if you recall, uh, last year or the year before, I guess it was, we hosted 50 years of this you know, M State Fergus Falls. Uh, next year will be the 50th anniversary of the foundation. It's been here for, for 50 years. And so that's exciting. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a testament to many of those who came before me. I've only been on the board for five years. So none of what you see here, I had nothing to do with any of it. So uh, put that to rest. This past year, you know, we've been under the leadership of our interim president, Peggy Kennedy, who's done a great job. Exciting things on campus now with, uh, with the uh, new presidential candidates coming in. And we should have a decision there fairly soon. I do want to end with these words. This foundation exists because of your generous support. Uh, so many of you have been supportive of this college in the past and will continue to be. Uh, your gifts are very much appreciated. Every size, every type. Uh, it's put to the best use that your money can, can be put to in, in uh, a uh, giving context. So I thank you. Thank you for your support. And. Uh, so, have another uh, good year. We look forward to having another good year. I, uh, I know I have the, uh, the pleasure and the opportunity of introducing uh, this year's lecturer. Uh, as we welcome to the podium, Richard L. Pemberton. We've had an opportunity to review his uh, many accomplishments over a lifetime, and uh, perhaps beginning to gain an understanding of how remarkable, remarkable it is for our community to have a person of big stature. And uh, it is of his stature that I will briefly speak. I have been fortunate to enjoy over the years Dick's gift for storytelling, but of the many stories that I've heard, this is one that I just heard recently. And the story that Dick tells is that one uh, Monday morning, back when he was in the second or third year of uh, law school at the University of Minnesota, a number of fellow students were coming up to him to congratulate him on being the leading scorer for the law school's intramural basketball championship team. And this was no small accomplishment. Uh, law students and lawyers, too, consider themselves to be more than competent in many areas. And uh, this includes on the basketball court. The intramural championship was hotly contested each year, and the results of the weekend tournament had been promptly posted at the school. And, well, Dick was very pleased to accept the congratulations of his peers. But as he had spent the week, weekend engaged in other activities altogether, he was also a bit curious. <laughs> it turns out that uh, the first year law student uh, who was uh, somehow wasn't eligible to play in that tournament, uh, and who happened to have been a basketball star on that Luther College, was recruited to the winning team. <laughs> who had him play under the name of Richard Kimberly. <laughs> which makes sense, he would associate uh, Dick with uh, dunking the basketball. <laughs> well, that's how, uh, and that's also how Richard Pemberton first became acquainted with Luther College basketball star and future partner, Richard Heck. <laughs> Many of you know. I believe that the statute of limitations has passed on uh, that recruiting violation, and that's why 
and safe to embellish the table before you can see me. Would you please welcome a man of stature in court or on the court, the real Richard Pemberton. <laughs> Taking things over. 
Um, how much, how much of an apology am I going to make for the uh, uh, for the uh, lawyers, <laughs> plaintiffs lawyers, wearing gold, uh, who have bamboozled naive jurors uh, into uh, rendering outrageous verdicts that have driven my critics. Uh, insurance premiums sky high and have driven doctors out of business. Um, you know, I'm not going to apologize for those folks because I don't think they exist. Uh, I am going to apologize for the civil justice system uh, because it is in difficulty right now. And it's in difficulty for a couple of reasons. One is that it's been under attack since the 1970s, uh, a very vicious attack by the media quite a lot of the time, by certain elements of corporatocracy, um, and the insurance industry is not excluded therefrom, uh, and others uh, to convince people that indeed their high insurance premiums and doctors going out of business is the result of outrageous uh, jury verdicts uh, and uh, uh, lawyers uh, who, who bring that about by pulling the wool over uh, the jurors' eyes. Um, I, I spent 20 years um, on the Statutory Judicial Selection Commission of the state of Minnesota uh, going around to interview applicants for judicial uh, uh, vacancies to be appointed by the governor. Uh, uh, we always uh, have gone to the chambers uh, in one of the 87 counties where the vacancy occurs uh, and uh, uh, interviewed uh, a dozen or so people after having made a, uh, made a paper cut sometimes of 50 or 60 or sometimes even more uh, who were interested in the job. A lot of people that aren't making so much money in the practice of law that they would like to get on a regular salary. Uh, and uh, I've seen a lot of those folks. Um, and I've always asked the question, um, considering my own background, um, how many, um, how many uh, trials have you tried to the jury verdict? And I used to get answers of a of, uh, hundred. So, uh, or 75, or more than 100, or something like that. Uh, in more recent years, after the attack that has been going on uh, on the civil justice system, as I define it, dealing with significant disputes between businesses and uh, people who have been injured, um, contract disputes, uh, of cases involving uh, professional malpractice, not just medical malpractice, but legal malpractice, and, uh, accounting and other professional malpractices, and so forth. Um, and <clears throat> in my most recent years, <clears throat> um, I'll get an answer from somebody, well, I've tried a lot of them, I've tried six. Um, and if you were to uh, talk to a judge uh, who's maybe been on the bench for about five years and ask him or her, how many uh, uh, complex jury cases has that judge tried in the last five years? You might get an answer, not a single one, or maybe one or two. Why? Why is this happening? Uh, I, I claim it is a murder-suicide pact. Uh, the murder is being conducted by those that would wish that uh, the United States of America no longer had a jury trial system. And in that regard, uh, I put it to you that if you're in the right, you stand a better chance of getting a fair shake from a jury of people off the street, um, off the fields and the farms, out of the, the factories, um, wherever, than you do from a judge or from someone like myself uh, acting as an arbitrator, a private judge, because 
people that are repeatedly in the role of finding facts and judging bear, carry with them baggage. Jurors, in this area, I'm not going to say what it's like in Dade County, Florida, necessarily, or Maricopa County, uh, Arizona, or, um, or maybe in Detroit, or uh, some other places, maybe, maybe I, I don't have that experience, but around here, and over all the years, I found that jurors take their oath very seriously, try to do the right thing, and are plenty smart enough not to be bamboozled by lawyers, uh, even the ones who are dumb enough to wear gold to court. Uh, and uh, it, it, it just hasn't been happening. But the, the, uh, the suicide part of, of the fact is that the civil justice system uh, has not been working the way that it should. And I'm going to talk about each of those things a little bit, uh, and hopefully not use up all of the time, uh, because indeed I do want to talk about the search for justice on broad terms, and I do want to talk about values that make life worth living because I think the search for justice is all part and parcel of what I have been doing, a very small part of it, but the search for justice has been much broader than just what I've been doing. Uh, and some would say that uh, if there is no justice for you in life, that indeed life is not worth living. And, but we'll talk about that as well. Okay, let's talk about, first of all, whether or not in fact, uh, lawyers and jurors are doing crazy things uh, that, uh, that uh, have, have brought this about. Uh, and that it would be a good thing if we didn't have any more jury trials and the insurance uh, premiums would all go down uh, and the doctors would all go back into practice and, and so forth. Um, well, let's talk about the one that two presidents of the United States have talked about. Let's talk about the hot coffee case, the McDonald's coffee case. Isn't that an outrage? Somebody spilled some coffee uh, clumsily uh, on her lap. She shouldn't have been having holding it over her lap in the first place. Uh, and, uh, and she sued McDonald's. And the jury verdict was $2.7 million. Come on, what's going on here? Well, you might want to uh, view this documentary. It, uh, it uh, was a special selection of the Sundance Film Festival. And it was the grand jury prize of the Seattle Film Festival, and it's available uh, from docuramafilms.com. Uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting. It's the other side of the story. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, there aren't two sides to the story sometimes. I'm not saying that there haven't been uh, runaway juries and that there haven't been lawyers who did what they shouldn't have done. But let's talk about the McDonald's uh, coffee case particularly. We have an, an elderly woman, uh, not by my standards, she wasn't elderly, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, she was a passenger in a car and uh, 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 the driver of the car bought her a cup of coffee and uh, she's, she made the mistake of putting the coffee uh, between her uh, legs to hold it steady while the car was, she thought, not going to move, uh, but it did move, and the coffee spilled. What she didn't know is that that coffee was at 185 or 190 degrees. Well, if you've ever monkeyed around with your hot water <coughs> heater at home, uh, you'll know that uh, if it was set above 140, uh, you were violating the instructions in there, and it shouldn't have been set uh, any higher than that. But then McDonald's uh, was mandating it. Why? Who knows? One reason might be that uh, people don't usually drink their coffee right away when they've ordered it, and they're 
getting up, driving down the road, and coffee tastes better when it's still warm by the time you drink it. They don't get away to drinking it until they've left.